Welcome to session one of the Instron Biomedical Testing Open House, PPE testing in the age of COVID-19. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Nick Erickson, your host for this session. For this discussion, Landon Goldfarb, one of our senior applications engineers, will be taking us through some important considerations when testing personal protective equipment, including an overview of international testing standards optimal test setups, and best practices for repeatable results. As a senior applications engineer at Instron, Landon works closely with our customers to recommend appropriate testing systems and accessories. For example, a customer may be developing a new product that uses a material they've never tested before, and they might need some recommendations for gripping. So one of our application engineers, such as Landon, would take some of their specimens into our applications lab to run some tests using various grips, jaw faces, extensometers, and then come back to them with some recommendations. For today's presentation, uh, Landon will use around 25 to 30 minutes for his discussion, and then we should, <coughs> excuse me, and then we should have time for Q&A. So I encourage you to use the chat to submit any relevant questions you might have as we go along. And then one last thing I did want to mention before we begin, for those of you that are interested in receiving the single-use code for free access to the Essentials of Biomedical Testing e-learning course, uh, this is just a quick reminder that you'll want to complete the post-event survey that will display immediately following this session. I'll be sure to remind you again at the end. So with that said, I'm going to turn things over to Landon. Thanks, Nick. Uh, good afternoon, everybody and welcome to our session on PPE testing in the age of COVID-19. So like Nick said, my name is Landon Goldfarb, uh, a senior application engineer. So I actually have a focus in the biomedical industry. So I work really closely with companies working on drug delivery devices, uh, things like syringes, auto injectors, PPE, kind of anything within the biomedical industry. Um, I work with customers to help them find the right solution. So in today's session, we're going to first take a look at what's the current situation. So what is the global supply and demand of PPE? What are the challenges right now? What's the regulatory environment uh, surrounding PPE? And what are kind of the barriers that are holding people back? Uh, what are the, you know, looking at each different type of application and what the tests look like, what international standards are there, how do we properly perform the test and what kind of results should we be expecting? And then finally, we'll have a question and answer section. And you can always type questions into the panel throughout the entire presentation. I'll be tracking them, and then towards the end, we'll go over each one uh, one by one. So without further ado, we'll get started. So it really should be no surprise to anybody that PPE has become one of the most frequently requested applications in the past year. We really live in unprecedented times, and the global spread of the coronavirus has driven the demand for these products exponentially as a necessity for all frontline workers. Personal protective equipment is being consumed faster than it can be produced, with str suppliers struggling to keep up. According to CAPS research, approximately 40% of companies say increased demand for PPE is still their single greatest sourcing challenge. In the face of adversity, the global manufacturing community has come together, switching gears in many instances to help erase the production deficit. Companies such as Apple and Under Armour have dedicated production resources to supplement the global supply of PPE. Other firms have leveraged new technologies such as 3D printing to manufacture supplies, with the most notable examples being 3D printed nasal swabs and face shields. Regardless of the pace of production, quality control testing is still required to ensure the products will perform as needed on the front lines. The key exception is non-medical grade consumer face masks, which, not, which do not need to undergo formal quality control evaluation. Within the United States, the FDA is the main regulatory body overseeing the production and distribution of PPE. Across the globe, each country has their own governing entity evaluating markets before being released to the market. Under normal circumstances, of which this is certainly not, manufacturers of PPE would have needed to submit 
pre-market notification to the FDA and undergo extensive product audits before being released. All FDA registered products are defined as class one, two, or three. The lower the class, the fewer barriers to approval exist. It is important to note almost all PPE falls under class one, the lowest risk level, with a couple exceptions, most notably uh, surgical gowns. Even as a class one device, the time needed to gain approval could be on the order of months or even years in some cases. When facing an unrelenting and urgent pandemic, unfortunately time is not an afforded luxury. In an effort to minimize the barriers to bringing greatly needed PPE to the market, the FDA has enacted emergency use authorizations or EAUs. These EAUs are issued during times of national public health crises and essentially lowers the burden for approval of medical products. This enables manufacturers to expedite their production expansion as well as simplifying the process for companies who are new to PPE and are starting up production. These EUAs have been released as blanket statements covering certain types of PPE, but for a full understanding of the policy, always confer with your company's compliance officers. In addition to just simply expanding production, other measures to expand capacity have been optimizing the existing supply, which in some instances means disinfecting and actually reusing PPE. This measure, these measures absolutely emphasize the need for extensive quality control to ensure these products will work not only the first, but second and third time if necessary. In the current climate, the performance of PPE in the field is critical. And as such, it is vital that manufacturers perform failure analysis on their products. These measures help prevent the release of a compromised product into the field, which could have potentially harmful consequences. Today, we're gonna to focus on gloves, masks, gowns, and nasal swabs. And while nasal swabs I know are not technically PPE, I want to include them because of their increasing use in COVID test kits. Many companies pivoting towards the production of PPE already possess universal testing machines, which are aptly named. By swapping out the fixtures, many systems can be ready to test PPE with just the acquisition of a few accessories. Let's discuss some of the main testing standards allowed followed for PPE, optimal test setups, and expected results. The first, first we're gonna talk about gloves. And the first major hurdle in performing glove testing is really just wading through the sheer number of international standards which reference the evaluation of gloves. While they each have similar procedures, there are subtle differences which are important to be aware of. ASTM has four different testing standards which are defined really by the material of the glove. ASTM D6319 is most commonly used considering Nitrile gloves have really become the most prevalent in all hospital settings. While the test procedure is identical across those ASTM standards, the actual physical requirements for strength and elongation do differ based on the material. The procedure and the specimen geometry of those standards are based on ASTM D412, which is the standard for tensile testing of elastomers, a very common standard uh, in the elastomer industry. ISO 11193 defines two types of gloves, latex rubber or any other elastomeric material, including nitrile. The test procedure similar to ASTM is based on their elastomeric tensile testing standard, ISO 37. EN 455-2 is probably the most commonly used standard internationally and has some really important key differences. The first is the differentiation of glove types based on end use, not the material. Samples are categorized and evaluated either as single use examination gloves or surgical gloves. And within the COVID crisis, single use examination gloves are more so being used. Secondly, there's no requirement for elongation measurements in the report, which is a really important thing to know when running these tests. Lastly, an important correction has to be made for the thickness of the material. Due to the manufacturing process, 
of gloves, the thickness of the material at the palm, which I have circled, where specimens are actually cut from for testing can be larger than at the fingertip. If this difference is greater than 10%, a correction factor has to be applied to the tensile strength, which will compensate for the weakest part of the glove. Now that we have looked at the standards, we can discuss test texturing. The maximum loads for this type of testing is typically under 100 newtons. Considering only the tensile strength is a required result, larger load cells with wider verifiable ranges can be used, reducing the total number of cells needed. Pneumatic side action grips are often the go-to gripping solution for these materials. Constant gripping pressure, reduced variability between tests, and interchangeable jaw faces provide flexibility to test different types of specimens. Especially for really thin elastomers, rubber coated or smooth jaw faces are ideal to avoid jaw breaks. Integrated specimen holding devices can actually help speed up specimen insertion, specimen insertion, I apologize, uh, because especially with thin specimens, it can be very tedious to insert them into the grips, upper and lower, while also attempting to maintain perfect alignment. So adding this small uh, add-on fixture can actually reduce the total test time and increase throughput. Blue Hill Universal has built-in pre-configured methods to ease the method development process. The operator can actually utilize user-defined calculations along with logic functions to automatically determine whether that correction factor, as we discussed with EN455, is actually needed. This reduces the amount of post-testing analysis needed, confirming the batch conforms quicker. Elastomeric grips are purposefully designed for thin materials, providing a proportional clamping force, which increases with axial load. These grips are simple to use and provide a really cost-effective solution. While the standards don't explicitly require extensometry, for the most accurate strain measurement, a non-contacting solution should be used. Applying marks to the specimen, an AVE or advanced video extensometer can track strain until failure. Due to the geometry and the thickness of the specimens, any contacting solution would most likely cause premature failures. Specimens have to be punched out of the glove using the appropriately sized dive punch. Typically, manual or pneumatic punches are available depending on the number of specimens being tested. Obviously, pneumatic is better for throughput, especially if you're running a large sample size. The specimen preparation is really important for ensuring repeatability, as any nicks or cuts on the edge of the specimen can result in a premature failure. So I'm really quickly just going to show a video showing um, a few glove tests actually running, just so you can get a sense of what the test Here we have a test on a 3400 single column with the elastomeric grips. And then here we have the pneumatic side action grips on a 6800 single column. So now we're gonna move on to masks. Interestingly, there are no ASTM or ISO standards that directly reference the mechanical testing of masks. Most standards commonly used address their ability to withstand penetration of biological matter. Therefore, a lot of companies that manufacture these products really perform testing to internally driven specifications and requirements. There is a wide range of face mask products currently on the market, all of which undergo very similar testing. The most commonly used by the general public is the surgical mask, which is typically single use. N9, N95 or N99 masks are usually reserved for frontline workers and form a tight seal between outside air and the mouth. Certain masks also have exhalation valves, which reduce the buildup of heat and humidity. 
Not shown here are cloth masks, which are not as often mass produced and more commonly homemade. The same testing principles would apply to those masks as well. The fabric material used to construct the mask should be tested to ensure quality in the finished product. In the case of the N95 mask, the non-woven fabric would ideally be tested prior to being molded to its final shape, if only just to simplify the testing. Additionally, as most of these masks will consist of four to six layers of material, the test should be performed on the fully layered material. If testing out different layers, you could test those individually um, as seen as this removable filter layer test on the screen. The test for these specimens is best approximated by ASTM 5034, a simple tensile strength test of fabric. Side acting grips are preferred with either smooth or serrated faces, depending on the thickness of the material. Typically for a surgical mask where there are fewer layers, smooth is preferred. Serrated faces could dig into the material too much and cause a premature failure. The elastic bands which keep the face mask in place are under constant tension during use and as such should be tested extensively. The connection point between the band and the mask is arguably the weakest point regardless of the connection mechanism. Depending on the style of mask, it could be sewn in place, held by adhesive or secured by staple. The testing of this connection can take a couple different forms the first of which best replicates the real world application. The use of an L-hook to pull a full elastic loop to failure can highlight potential manufacturing defects at the connection points or within the elastic band itself. Alternatively, the connection point could be more directly evaluated by pulling at a single location. This setup could also be used to perform a relaxation test. These masks are being worn for hours on end, necessitating durability. By pulling the band to a set distance and, and determining the drop in force over time could help actually define the allowable time to wear the mask before it will begin to loosen. Finally, the elastic band should be tested independently for tensile strength and total elongation. Due to the propensity for these elastic bands to thin, Serrated jaw faces with pneumatic grips should be utilized to test until failure. So I apologize for having to recreate this setup in PowerPoint, but I felt breaking an N95 mask solely for the purpose of this presentation was not a good use of PPE. And especially with talking about all the supply and demand going, issues going on, I thought I would try and recreate it this way to show how the test would work. The exhalation valve can be permanently affixed to the mask or can be removable. It is common to ensure that the valve is properly adhered to the mask by pulling at a set load for 15 to 30 seconds and confirming there is no separation. This test will require a component test plate, which as seen here is basically a tap test plate that would mount to the base of the system as well as a custom pull-off assembly to either mount directly to the load cell or be held in place with a grip. With a little PowerPoint wizardry, you see what the test would look like. This is very accurate. So really quickly, uh, I'm going to show some video of actual mass tests being performed. So here we see the L-hook test being performed with the pneumatic grips. And typically in this test, either one or both of the connection points will fail. Next, we have the single elastic band pullout. And then finally, we have a test of just the fabric of a surgical mask, which actually has different layers failing at different times. So this is good to understand what is the ultimate failure mode of the mask? So now we're gonna move on to gowns. 
gowns are usually identified as either surgical gowns or isolation gowns, depending on the use. In fighting this pandemic, most gowns have been used interchangeably, uh, but more commonly seen on the front lines are single-use non-woven gowns, which are typically made from synthetic fibers like polypropylene or polyethylene. Reusable gowns are generally made from woven materials like cotton and polyester. Navigating the sheer, excuse me, number of standards can seem daunting, but each test can typically be performed with the same set of grips with changing specimen geometries and jaw face selections. All testing should be performed on representative samples taken from the finished product. There are specific critical zones outlined by ANSI from which specimens should be taken, including the sleeves and the torso. Tensile testing of woven materials is typically performed with pneumatic grips to provide constant clapping force. Textiles are notoriously difficult to obtain failures within the gauge length since they can't have a reduced width. Using the largest size jaw face allowed by the standard mitigates the chance of jaw breaks by better distributing the clamping stresses. The tear strength is performed by using what is known as the trapezoidal method. The specimen is clamped in a way which promotes the tearing of the specimen from a central notch. And the tear test, I think, is almost a more important test as it will more likely replicate how one of these gowns would fail in the real world. Typically, they're not going to be pulled until they fail. It'll usually be a small tear or nick that eventually propagates and renders them unusable. The seam strength should be performed on all seams which are adjacent to a critical zone. Most commonly, the seam between the cuff and the sleeve is tested as it is a potential entry point for particles. This test uses an identical setup to determine the failure point of the seam. Non-woven gowns can vary in design from single layer plastic sheeting to multi-layer synthetic fabrics. As COVID testing centers have popped up globally, the need for inexpensive disposable gowns has risen dramatically. Considering these non-woven materials are essentially plastic thin films with special coatings, they are actually better evaluated with standards like ASTM D882 and ISO 527-3. Both tensile and both tensile strength and tear resistance standards require the specimen to be punched out of the gown material to ensure repeatability and accuracy of the results. These materials can be highly affected by any edge imperfections due to the die punch process. Tensile testing of thin films can be tricky due to the tendency for the material to extrude from the grips after yield. To combat this effect, line contact style faces or the thin film grips pictured here are ideal. The tear test is performed with a special geometry designed to create local stress concentrations at the point of tearing and force the tear propagation to occur in a straight line. So like I said, I thought it was prudent to include nasal swabs in this presentation considering the expanding role they play in containing this epidemic. Nasopharyngeal or NP swabs are crucial tools in the, in the diagnosis of influenza and respiratory diseases. Despite their similar appearance, these swabs are considerably more specialized than the standard cotton swabs used for personal hygiene. Using synthetic fibers for the swab staff and tiny bristles or complex geometries for the tip. In an effort to bolster the global supply, significant collaborations have occurred between 3D printer manufacturers and medical research teams, which have resulted in a massive increase in the production capacity of test quality NP swabs. It is critical to perform mechanical testing to determine if the performance of these printed swabs is comparable to that that are produced by standard methods. There are no existing standards currently which provide insight on this testing so all test procedures are really based on best practice and internal requirements. Nasal swabs are purposefully designed with a breakpoint 
in order to efficiently transport the sample into the test tube. As you can see, the circle goes to a point where you would break the actual swab so it would fit in the standard size test tube. This structural deficiency is critical to preparing the sample to ship to the lab. The three-point bend test can be used as a quality control measure to determine the force threshold required to break the swab. The maximum load required should be a set benchmark for evaluation. The three-point bend fixture support span should be set to around 25 millimeters to best replicate the actual failure modes. In, in terms of this testing, we used a 10 millimeter anvil diameter, which is a common anvil size used in test labs and works really well for this application. The cantilever bend test best represents the stresses seen when the swab is actually held during the procedure. The material needs to be flexible enough to ensure it will not fail during the test. And this setup is accomplished using a component test plate and a screw action grip, which is actually used to hold the specimen in place. Any probe can be used to deflect the tip of the swab. In this image, we actually use the upper loading anvil of a three-point bend fixture. This test will also confirm that the structural weak point that we discussed in the last slide is actually not gonna be damaged or broken during the actual procedure itself. With the use of 3D printing technology, new geometries for swab tips are being tested to maximize specimen collection and patient comfort. The tip needs to be able to withstand shear forces as it moves across the walls of the nasal passage. In order to test this property, the tip and the base of the swab are clamped with advanced screw action grips to evaluate the maximum force required to break the bristles uh, or the tip itself. Not shown here, but also necessary for a complete evaluation of the tip is torsional tests replicating the typical torques actually seen during use. So thank you all for listening in. I'm now happy to take any all questions you may have. Any that I can't get to right now, I will respond to you personally after we finish up this session. Um, and I also just wanted to plug that we actually have a PPE testing guide on Intron's web webpage, which has a lot of this content and more uh, for, for your reference. So I'm gonna quickly turn on the webcam so you can actually see me and I will pull up some questions which have come in um, before we ran the session. So let's see. So we had a question um, that we were, they're interested in tests of N95 ASTM 2100 masks in the view of detecting counterfeit. So using this type of testing to evaluate whether a mask is counterfeit or not. Um, so, you know, there are a couple of things to consider. First of all, being what are the key ways to differentiate whether a mask is counterfeit or not? Um, typically, I would imagine the main differentiators would less be in the mechanical properties and more the actual permeability of the masks to bacteria and other airborne particles. Um, but I would imagine that a lot of the maybe possible ways they could cut corners were how the bands are adhered to the mask. So certainly that pull-off test could be a good way to establish some sort of differentiation between actual masks and cheaply made masks that are knockoffs. Um, it really would have to depend if you even have real N95 masks to compare to so you can get a baseline for what the results should be. So moving on. Um, how can I select the cross the correct crosshead speed for PPE? Um, so depends, you know, really on the PPE in question. Um, for gloves, typically, if you're going to be testing, to it doesn't even matter if it's ISO 37 or D412, whichever ASTM or ISO, uh, you'll be about 500 millimeters a minute. Uh, if you are doing testing for fabrics, that's usually 300 millimeters a minute. So for the woven or non-woven gowns, 
you know, usually the standard will always say what the correct testing speed is. And then for the instances where we're doing the um, masks or the nasal swabs, since we are kind of, uh, those are internal standards, you can play with the test speeds to find one that you find gets the most repeatable results. You may find you have very different failure forces for the elastic band connection if you test at five millimeters a minute or 500 millimeters a minute. And if you were to think which is more likely to happen in the real world, um, you'd probably go for a quicker speed um, because it's very unlikely somebody is going to be very slowly trying to break it. Um, it may accidentally break it by moving very quickly. So which are the ASTM or ISO standards used in PP material testing? Um, kind of went over a lot of them today, and I understand there are a lot to wade through. Uh, so that reference, that site that I had mentioned before has a lot of those standards listed out for the different applications. Um, so that's something you can always refer back to. And those are the questions I had, and it doesn't look like any more or come in or have come in since. Uh, so if that's the case, I'm going to hand it back over to Nick. Thank okay. you all for listening. I appreciate it. Thanks, Landon. Um, and actually, uh, thanks for turning off your webcam because I noticed that it looks like on mobile. Um, yeah, uh, we can see the slide now that you've turned that off. So that's great. Thank you. Um, so like Landon said, that's going to do it for today. But I did want to leave on a few quick notes. Um, we have three more days packed full of great content ahead. Um, and Landon, if you don't mind just throwing up that, that slide showing the um, tomorrow schedule, this is what's coming up. If you'd like to attend any of these sessions but aren't registered yet, just head to instron.com now to sign up. And I'm actually just gonna drop a direct link into chat right now in case you're interested in, in heading over there now. Um, the recording from this session will be available on our YouTube channel in just a short while. So each of you will also receive an email with a link to that. And just as another reminder about receiving the single use code for free access to the um, e-learning course, in just a moment when we end this session, a survey will pop up and there's gonna be a question related to this. You'll just need to complete the survey and then indicate whether you'd like access to this course. Um, so with that said, I just wanna thank Landon for a great presentation. And thanks to all of you for attending. We really appreciate your time, and we hope you'll join us for more sessions during this week's Biomedical Open House. Take care, everyone.